Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. This is uh, Shweta and I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. We have come to the last panel of 2019 and uh, Pretty glad that uh, Adam is moderating this panel. This is the fourth panel that uh, Adam is moderating for us. If you have not seen the others, please go to the video panel section of our website and you will find the other three over there. Uh, today's panel is about chemical recycling. We have Paula from Close Loop Partners and we have Adrian from Recycling Technologies. So I'm just gonna quickly hand this over to Adam who will go ahead with his chat now. Go on Adam. Thank you, Shweta. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are around the world. Um, it's a pleasure to be back for my fourth and final uh, webinar of the year. Um, we've had some great conversations in the past about global recycling markets. We've talked about developing economy transition strategies. And today we get to pick up something far more technical, but hopefully we'll, we'll be able to keep it, um, keep it accessible to all of you in terms of chemical recycling. Now, for me, um, you know, I work at Suez and Suez have been looking at chemical recycling for many, many years. You know, we see it as one of those portfolio of technologies that suits a certain feedstock and plays a key role in uh, closed loop economies in putting materials back into the marketplace. But we haven't committed ourselves in a big way into any of the technologies. We've been monitoring the market, we've been doing our own analysis, and we've been trying to understand the, the risks, the opportunities, the threats, both in terms of t um, traditional technology and how the uh, chemical recycling opportunities may sit alongside, say, mechanical recycling, for example, but also to understand you know, what feedstocks we need to capture and the quality of that material in order that you can make these facilities really fly. So that's my context. And, and you know, we've been looking at this quite a bit over the last few months. And, and you, we've seen an enormous number of, of research reports coming out and positive statements by large petrochemical companies and their partners looking at huge investments in pilot projects uh, and new R&D. So I think this is a great time to be considering not only what does chemical recycling mean for you, but also what where might it go in the next four or five years in terms of a global opportunity for both technology providers, but also policy makers? Because if we can't get the policy setting right, then some of these new technologies may, may struggle to come to the fore. Now, when I'm talking about chemical recycling, you might hear some, some, some weird and wonderful phrases. We might talk about depolymerization, um, breaking the polymer bonds, and you might hear about thermal cracking, which involves pyrolysis uh, and gasification type technologies. So you're gonna hear a bit about both of those from our experts today. Um, so you, we've got Paula speaking first and then Adrian will be speaking second. I'm gonna give them the floor in the moment. Their, uh, their job is to give us a bit of flavor about who they are, why they're interested in chemical recycling, what they're doing right now, and where they think the opportunities and threats may be. And then once they've both spoken, I'll, um, I'll pose a few questions, get the thing going, and then hopefully uh, you, the, uh, the engaged participants, will start to fire in your questions and that'll make my job easier because all I've got to do is frame them for my two experts and share their experience and maybe a little bit of my experience and, and that of Suez as we go. 50 minutes from now, we'll start to wrap up and we'll thank everybody and uh, hopefully it'll be a good session. So that's enough from me. First up, Paula, welcome to uh, Be Waste Wise webinar. Thanks, Adam. It's good to be here and good morning, afternoon or evening to everyone um, uh, on the call today. So thanks for having me. My name is Paula Liu. I'm a director at um, Closed Loop Partners, which is an impact investing firm based in New York City that focuses on building the transition um, to or supporting the transition to a circular economy. So at the firm, um, we have a number of different funds um, that focus on um, circular economy. We have a venture capital arm, a private equity arm, and a project finance arm, um, all that uh, have different sort of strategies, um, but our investments are global and from an infrastructure perspective, we're focused on North America. Our fourth arm is the Center for the Circular Economy. Um, I sit on that team, which is an innovation R&D team, and that's where our chemical recycling research lies. Um, in 2018, uh, we launched an initiative around chemical recycling um, to really investigate the potential of the sector, understand who the key players were, um, and as, as part of that initiative, uh, we released a report in April um, with, in partnership with the American Chemistry Council and Google 
um, to to highlight 60 companies in the space that fell um, in three categories that or under three categories, um, which we call purification. So that's the technologies um, that do not change the state of the polymer. So simply remove perhaps color or um, smells from, from um, specific resin types. Um, pure cycle is an, is an example of that. Um, then there's decomposition technologies, which Colzuk Partners defines as the technologies that um, break down um, the, the carbon bonds in the plastic um, into monomers and intermediaries that can be sold as specialty waxes. For example, Green Mantra is an example of that. Um, and then last but not least are the tried and true technologies that fall under conversion, uh, the conversion bucket. So these are technologies that are breaking down plastic into their monomer and polymer form. Um, and, and really the most basic of the building blocks that you can um, bring plastic back to. Uh, and that can go in, back into a plastic supply chain, but other product supply chains as well as fuels. Um, Colgate Partners' perspective on chemical recycling is that, um, you know, mechanical recycling plays a very important role in, in recycling of our plastics. Um, and chemical recycling can be entirely complementary to that. Um, there's certainly a demand for recycled content in the market that we're seeing that poses massive market opportunities. So when we ran our analysis, we found that only 6% of the demand for uh, recycled plastic was currently being met. That becomes much more nuanced when you look at particular resins. Um, polypropylene, for example, only 2% of that demand for recycled content was being met where PET was the highest, unsurprisingly, at 19%. Um, so the demand and the market pool for, for uh, and, and case to incorporate chemical recycling um, as a solution to, to build up that supply and meet that demand is there. Um, but the, it, the industry is still in its infancy. Um, we found that on average it took uh, a, a chemical recycling or, or advanced recycling technology 17 years to go from lab to growth stage. Um, and that made up, uh, and the, the amount of companies in the 60 that we, um, that we evaluated in, in our first report, um, there was only you know, uh, less than 30% of all of those companies were at growth stage. Um, and so without collaboration, um, Without collaboration, without uh, policymakers and different stakeholders, investors, brands really coalescing to leverage their supply chains, create policies, um, and, and uh, essentially continue to invest in our recycling infrastructure, that growth in the sector, we believe, will, will remain uh, relatively slow and certainly not fast enough for brands um, to meet their aggressive uh, circularity goals or um, goals around incorporating post-consumer content into their products and packaging. Um, and so Close with Partners, from our perspective, is we want to move the needle on that 17-year number. Um, and, and we acknowledge that there's still knowledge gaps around the technologies. Not all the technologies have been proven, far from it. Um, there, are, there are strong contenders. Um, and there are, and it's very exciting to see the number of partnerships and announcements being made in the market. At the time that we released the report, we counted over 250 um, different kinds of at least one-on-one -on -one collaborations between technology providers and brands or investors or governments. Um, and so the, we are at an inflection point in the sector and it's exciting to be a part of, um, but we are continuing as investors, we're continuing our research around these technologies to better understand um, their use case, to better understand the environmental and human health impacts of these technologies and to better understand what investments need to be made, um, not only in these technologies, but along the value chain um, in order to be able to incorporate and uh, successfully integrate um, these technologies to meet commercial needs. Wow. Thank you, Paula. That's uh, 
that's fantastic. I mean, you've, you've, you're all over the space. You've been looking at all of those technologies. You've been looking at the issues. That's, um, that's a great starter for 10. Can I just remind the, uh, the audience at the bottom of your panel, there's a, there's a tab you can click on Q&A in there and can drop us a line. If you've got a specific question for Paula, now's a good time to be writing it to me and I can make sure I can factor that into the ongoing discussions. Um, just one quick question for you, Paula, before I hand over to Adrian. What do you think, what's, what's been the biggest area in that 17 year transition? If you, if, I'm sure it's not one thing, it's never one thing, is it? But mm -hmm. you know, is there one thing that we would need to change to make 17 years five so that this was a much more rapid transition? I, I think the the infrastructure, the recycling infrastructure, the collections and the sortation piece, particularly in the North America where we have single stream recycling, um, has perhaps hamstrung a lot of the technology players to reach commercial scale. Um, and I'm gonna cheat and name one more thing. <laughs> um, and also note that, you know, for the, a long time, the, the incentives and the pull from the market hasn't existed um, to, to view chemical recycling as um, a viable and critical piece of the solution set to address our plastic waste issue, which is undeniable. Um, and, so for, and so we've seen technologies that have existed for a while, like pyrolysis and gasification, essentially or oftentimes because of those market drivers and incentives go from plastics to fuel. Um, and so it hasn't fit into the lexicon or framework and thinking around sustainability and um, circularity. Um, and, and it hasn't made sense for these technologies to play in a plastics to plastic supply chain because they're competing with an extremely efficient um, and robust uh, competitor, and that's the virgin production of plastic. I mean, it doesn't get more efficient than that. Thank you. Fantastic segue there from, from Paula into Adrian. Uh, Adrian will introduce himself and, and tell you a little bit about his experience both inside our sector and, 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 and outside, and, and maybe talk a little bit about some of that UK, UK projects that are really starting to push forward on, on, on chemical recycling. So over to you, Adrian, and then we're going to start a bit of Q&A with the pair of you. Hi, so I'm Adrian Howarth. I spent 35 years with GE Energy before retiring and then meeting the founder of Recycling Technologies in its very early days. Uh, and have seen the, the growth now to where we are with some 85 employees and on the cusp of uh, launching what we believe will be a major impact in chemical recycling. I, uh, because of my background, uh, I, I see great uh, analogies with the, the power sector. So uh, uh, if, if we were talking about development time and a lot of people have been critical of chemical recycling saying, Oh, it's, it's not ready, it'll never be commercial, it's taking too long. Uh, I, I was recently doing research on gas turbines, which was my speciality, which the first GE one came out in 49, it was 73 before we really started selling them commercially, and now they're ubiquitous across the world. And, and then we saw a change into wind turbines. Recently someone said, you know, wind, uh, uh, 20 years ago, someone said wind turbines will never be commercial. Um, they've been around for 500 years, but they're very commercial now. And the same could be said with solar. And I think another analogy to, to chemical recycling because of the cost of transporting waste, which is very similar to heat, but it's very difficult to move heat around. So what has happened in, 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 in that, that a lot of generations move from centralized power gen to localized uh, combined heat and power. And I think that's a very similar technology and commercial model uh, of similar size to what we are proposing as chemical recycling. Uh, it, 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 one, one of the issues when I came into this, there was a great deal of skepticism. We are basically using pyrolysis, which has been around since Archimedes, uh, which you use to make charcoal or whatever, but people had never focused on plastic and there were several reasons why not. One, it was cheap to landfill. Uh, the second was there was no real visibility and it was much cheaper to just use virgin plastic. But the world has changed and very much so in the last five years that there is a focus now. They don't want the plastic 
uh, littering, and David Attenborough and many of those programs have highlighted the issue with pollution. But there is a big focus uh, uh, on full cycle recycling. So there are a lot of players in this very large value chain that are not directly involved and will probably not be the owners of these plants, but are enabling these things to come to market. I, I would name, we've just been announced uh, as a partner in a project in Paris uh, with Total, Nestle and Mars to demonstrate that this can be done. Now, that those partners are very important. They're coming along now, they need to solve the problem. And when you get a market like that, where there is the will from the value chain to find a solution, that solution can be very quickly accelerated. And I think once the technology is proven, the money will flow in and there will be a significant increase in the amount of chemical recycling, which is also very complementary to mechanical recycling. It means that the mechanical recyclers do not have to uh, uh, take half of the material they can't mechanically recycle and, and spend a lot of money either uh, uh, landfilling that or pay, paying for uh, incineration. So I, 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 I very much think that this is like the, the, the wind, solar, or combined cycle plant uh, uh, market. And, and we're right now just about to cross the Rubicon, as we say in English, that uh, 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 the technology is now ready. It's been 20 years in development. We're not the first. There's been a lot of development in the United States in the early days without any help from, from subsidies uh, against a, a powerful market. There have been a 30 years of development starting in Japan that's moved around to Australia, came to Ireland. Suez had a, 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 some interest in that at one time, now down in, in, in Spain. These projects are now being made commercial. And as once that chemical recycling is demonstrated as robust and viable, I think the, the big sticker right now is the finance, is the money, uh, and that will come flooding in, is my estimation, once the technology is there and placed in an industry that's very risk averse. Wow, that's a very positive outlook, Adrian. This is no wonder you came out of retirement. There's there's uh, opportunities <laughs> on the horizon. I like it. Um, t tell me, Adrian, what's um from your perspective? I mean, recycling technologies actually got named in the UK go or sorry English government's national waste strategy this time last year as a case study of of innovation and opportunity. Uh, do you think we need a governance framework? to enable this technology or do you honestly believe the market's going to get there anyway because of the pull factors from from the from the big uh, petrochemicals and uh, and plastics no, and like, providers like and users? any of these technologies whether you're gas turbines I, I mean if you're just going back to the history of uh, combined heat and power that was all stimulated in the united states by a thing called the purple law which made it compulsory to buy the heat and that stimulated a whole new technology. And now you can find combined recycled plants in, in, all over. And, and Suez have many. Uh, what, what we've needed in, in this space is, is the, the, to, to stimulate the technology, you need the money. The, these are generally fairly substantial capital equipment type projects. It's not software, so you're talking some volumes of money. And uh, at one stage, there was no real uh, one incumbent. This is, this is actually uh, something that enables a value chain and therefore it's been a struggle initially to get everyone to agree who should be funding this, who's supporting it. Certainly now the very key driver is systems and, and, and starting in Europe really to support uh, uh, the recycling of plastic with the EPR schemes or whatever other scheme comes in. And once these are seen uh, to be robust and in place, if you can get guarantees that this money is going to be available in the pot, that then demonstrates on the early machines the economic viability. And then clearly once you're in the manufacturing mode, the prices will all come down. We probably won't need that subsidy. But you need a stimulus, just as you did for the solar market, for the wind market, for the combined heat and power market, uh, to get the, the, the desirable technological solution, then that's the way to go. And with the big focus on carbon, so there's this big thing, well, plastics are bad, but they're not. If you really look at 
a true carbon footprint. Plastic's a fantastic material, that's why we use it. It's light, it's easy to transport, it's very good. It, it's the litter is a problem. But if we, if, if, if you know, people are now saying we should ban plastic and move to paper, as far as carbon, that's a disaster. And even worse, if you move to glass. So there is this big incentive to be able to handle plastic and the difficult to recycle plastic. So chemical recycling really solves that solution. So I, 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 I think closed loop have seen this. There's a lot now of incentive that people just come in commercial now, truly commercial, not with a, 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 a machine just coming out of the lab, but these are really commercial units. And once as demonstrated, as was true with wind and solar, you, we've all seen worldwide how now these things are having impact. Uh, and I think chemical recycling is, is right there on the cusp. Thank you. So for both of you, um, I'm interested in, in feedstocks uh, and, and what feedstocks are ideally suited to what is a range of technology solutions. Chemical recycling isn't one thing. It's a bit like saying a MRF is a MRF. It's not. It's designed for a certain feedstock and a, and a, and a suite of end market products. So tell me a little bit from both your experiences, the work you've done, the research, the, the, the practical application. What material streams, because plastics, again, is a very broad brush, what material streams is chemical recycling ideally suited to handle? And what problem does it solve? Uh, Adrian. Paul, do, 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 you, do you want to start? And then I'll give you my piece on, on, on uh, uh, pyrolysis okay. technologies and gasification. Sure. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the overlap, there are several overlapping points that Adrian and I made in our introductions, but one that stood out to me is that chemical recycling is entirely complementary to mechanical recycling. And so I think contextualizing the feedstock um, uh, alongside mechanical recycling really, for me, means that chemical recycling is the solution for the plastics in the market that currently have no recycling options um, and are the hardest to recycle right now. Um, I think there are certain applications and industries as well where it's best suited. So Adrian mentioned the um, amazing collaboration that he's working on with Total um, and a number of food brands um, in France. Um, you know, there when we think about plastic and the regulations around certain plastics and in industry like the medical field or food and bev, um, there. Again, it less so, uh, my response is less about resins, but more about the application um, and, and where the technologies essentially fill a gap where there's currently gaps in our recycling um, infrastructure. Um, I think perhaps from a collect, you know, incorporating or, or thinking about collections and sortation um, in the context in, of North America, where we have single stream again, you know, I think about, it, theoretically, it's less complex to think about how our recycling infrastructure has to shift if from a front end, from a feedstock perspective, these technologies are relatively flexible and can take multiple types of plastics and, as opposed to one. Um, but that doesn't mean that the technologies that are economically viable, um, again, using pure cycle as an example, um, that only takes polypropylene at the moment um, can't be solutions and aren't uh, yeah aren't aren't viable solutions or shouldn't be commercially available. I think it's a very complex question. I think it's a very complex marketplace. Thank you. Yeah. Go on, in, Adrian. Tell us about tell us about your experiences on this because I'm I'm a huge. I mean, my background, of course, is is collection. So I'm I'm always interested in how how the user, my mum, my gran, even how are they going to make sure you get the feedstock you want? Well, I, I think we did a, a study through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation called Project Lodestar, which is available if people want to look for it online which came up with the marriage, the solution is really the marriage of mechanical recycling with uh, chemical recycling in its various forms. Uh, and the, for me, the, the solution then is all plastic, whatever, if it looks like plastic, smells like plastic, forget reading symbols on a clear plastic film, it's, it's nonsense. All plastic gets put into a plastic bag and goes to the plastics recycling center. 
And this could also this could could also be part of a larger MRF that's handling other materials. But if you separate the majority of plastics, so if you can lessen the contamination from organics, then with modern technologies, and there's a huge amount of technology being developed in the last five years, both from the, the, the optical sorters, the, the handlers, and then the various uh, chemical processes, uh, the, the plastics that suit each process can be sorted out by the professionals at that stage. There's no point asking the consumer to do it, nor does that make any sense from a transport standpoint. That if you don't have the volumes, it doesn't make sense. So all plastic into one bag, that goes to the local town MRF. So we're talking in our models, this would be two, 300,000 people in Europe has a central MRF. Uh, or, or, or in, in that MRF, there is a plastics recycling facility. Uh, there are certainly some types, so I, I, I'm not a chemist, uh, uh, but I, I explain it this way to those like me. What pyrolysis people want, the people that are breaking the plastic down, they want hydrogen and carbon. So if you put hydrogen and carbon in a pot and heat it, you will end up with hydrogen and carbon. So all, if you just break up the change, you will end up of some form, and that can be from waxes through petrols down to naphthas. And our goal is to have the feedstock for more plastic, so we get full recycling. But from our standpoint, we want hydrogen and carbon. If there's oxygen there, it will combust. And so one of the plastics that lends itself to mechanical recycling is PET, which is a major piece of the food packaging industry. You don't really find it anywhere else, actually, but it's a food packaging. But actually, that lends itself to mechanical recycling and some of the other forms of solvolysis, if you will, the methanolysis and the chemical recycling space. And there's been a lot of work on PET around the world. These are very complementary because we don't want the PET, really. And so if you put these two technologies together, you take the PET out and you do whatever you want to with that. There may be a case for polystyrene being kept separate. It's much easier to keep polystyrene separate because styrene is a reactive agent. But so you could have a polystyrene entity and then all the others. So that's polypropylene, polyethylene, butadine come into a pyrolysis process. Um, it doesn't matter if that's mixed, and we will just turn it back into a feedstock to make more plastic. Uh, so for me, it's it, it, it's very simple. Now, clearly, for those that have been in the industry, there are some complications of contamination and others. But in fact, if we started by just saying to policymakers, look, guys, just keep the plastic separate and don't ask people to sort it out. Uh, at curbside. So just bring it all to us and we will sort it out. I think with that process, and we're doing trials right now with Tesco's, that have been, we, we, we started a thing earlier in the year where we, we, we said, bring all your plastic to the back to the store and we'll, we, we'll demonstrate how this can, this can be separated and, and, and converted using uh, chemical recycling. That had been totally oversubscribed. I mean, the amount of people that were willing to support that program, which is it's now closed, waiting for us to do that processing. But we believe if you do that, if you if you keep all plastic separately, it's easier for everyone uh, to do that. The professionals at a plastics recycling facility, as we call this, an advanced plastics recycling facility, uh, it can make these things very economic because they're both complementary to each other. So a perf with a chemical recycling facility will be more profitable from both sides, both the mechanical recycling and the chemical Thank you, Adrian. Now, from, from your perspective, recycling technologies likes to think of itself as a, a certain scale as part of a, a, a MRF kind of scenario, doesn't it? I mean, that, that, yes. that's very much how you are pitching in the UK market. I'm just wondering about other technology types and, and other markets. Do we think that's going to be the right approach everywhere? Because I think you're right, a, a feedstock that's mixed plastic, my mum can get that right wherever she happens to be on holiday. Um, you know, coming into a MRF that's, you know, designed to pull out PET, HDPE, you know, if you can capture those films early on, then, you know, fantastic or whatever. That, that to me does make a lot of sense. I think, you know, from a, as a waste management professional, that, that, that fits quite well with me. But do we see that being kind of the rule or the norm for most of these technology types around the world? 
Uh, Adrian first, then, then Paula, of course. Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. We, we've not just looked in the UK, we've been looking across Europe. Um, recently, we've been down visiting Indonesia and Singapore. Uh, there is, our model is very much a distributed model in that we, we, our size fits with a sort of a, a European sized town, about 300,000, a county town. Uh, uh, and that's typically where the MRF is. And the reason for that is that moving waste plastic is very expensive from a carbon standpoint. If you can avoid transferring load, you can demonstrate a saving in carbon. So that is why we believe it's better to move the product. There's a six-fold decrease in, in transport emissions if you convert to the product uh, uh, locally. So that's the way we went. But clearly, if you were in some of the big centres, Los Angeles or, 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 or Singapore, there is probably a case, and there certainly is a case, to build a bigger facility, and that may more take on the look of a, a, a refinery type design. But our model is to be very simple, very easy to permit, uh, and placed alongside the MRFs that exist, so we can scale very rapidly once we've demonstrated this technology. Exactly the same as combined heat and power has across Europe. I think there's 40,000 combined heat and power plants across Europe, which nobody ever realises, but they're going in all the time. Thank you. And Paula, your perspective on this? Yeah, it's something that Closer Partners is looking to looking to evaluate in this next phase of, of our initiative around chemical recycling, which launches in early 2020. Um, I think what's exciting about the sector is that there are plenty of technology providers that are still in that early commercial stage where they're also looking, looking for solutions or insight into how to right size their technologies. Um, but our perspective um, or how we're going to be analyzing that is to look at or do a waste characterization um, and plastic feedstock analysis in a particular market to then be able to say, okay, given what we know about what plastic is available from a post-consumer and perhaps um, a post-industrial perspective, what are the technology solutions at what size um, uh, uh, that are appropriate uh, given the data and information that we know. And it's not that far off from mechanical recycling. You know, um, at Closed Partners, we say recycling is local. I think that the for chemical recycling, it's going to very much uh, be a similar story in which there are going to be different technology solutions across different regions and different markets, given the policy incentives, uh, the waste, um, and the culture. Thank you. Uh, just conscious that we're getting lots of questions coming in from, from our, uh, our delegates on the line. So keep, keep them coming. I'll, I'll make sure we factor those in. Don't be shy. Remember, it's the panel at the bottom for those that haven't tried it yet. I'm, you know, I won't read your name out. Don't worry. It's anonymous. Um, so my steam panel, I, I'm interested in a couple of things. One, I think, is, is food grade. I think there's, a, there's quite an issue about food grade mechanical recycling from food grade to food grade because of the way that we regulate food grade space. Does, mechan does chemical recycling potentially give us a way around that issue uh, from your experience looking at this market? Because I think if that could give you the regulator and, you know, and, the, and the overall governance body's comfort that by going back to polymer or back to monomer, you're you know, you're, you're removing any of that food grade concern. Whereas in a mechanical recycling space, I think, you know, there are still concerns about, you know, the, the passing on of those, uh, uh, those risks, shall we say, from, 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 from history. What, how do we feel about that? Is that, a, is that an opportunity and a step forward that, that perhaps we could maximize with chemical recycling? Paula, you first. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly um, a very strong solution to, to for that particular industry um, and we're seeing a lot of interest from food and bev um, around chemical recycling for that very reason um, is it the only you know is it the only way that we're going to increase the ability to incorporate recycled content in food and bev no I think there's also work to be done around the design of packaging um, and and there's still tons of innovation happening around mechanical recycling, but chemical recycling is uh, an extremely viable solution for the sector or for that industry. 
thank you. Uh, that corroborates my my thoughts. And, and Adrian, uh, are you hearing anything different? Or, or yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, anything we produce through pyrolysis is food grade. You'd never know because it goes back to the molecules. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically virgin material. Then. So, so that leads me on to a, a second question. It's one that I know we've been debating in the UK a little bit. Is is chemical recycling, recycling or recovery? And I know there's quite a strong European campaign around this at the moment. There's some, some very large players with some very strong opinions about whether it should be considered recycling um, at that point in the hierarchy or whether it's really recovery. Uh, and I know some people would argue it's better than recycling because you go back to that, that, that raw uh, you know, monomer that, that, that is so uh, adaptable and usable. So t tell me about that, Adrian. Where, where does it sit on a hierarchy, a traditional hierarchy? It's better than recycling. The, uh, <laughs> I knew you'd say that. So, so this is a very difficult question because clearly we go back to a hydrocarbon. And that hydrocarbon will go into a petrochemical complex. Now, what does it come out as? Who knows what it comes out as? Uh, 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 because you can't track the molecules. So if we were saying, look, this is just displacement of oil and will be used to make plastic, all of this just makes sense on a mass balance. It's the only way you can measure it. So we, we don't intend, uh, although we could, and, and in fact, we could be an interim solution to transport fuels in, in that any pyrolysis oil has no sulfur in it. So one needs the new uh, MARPOL regulations for international sea transport. Uh, but that aside, if you're going back to uh, uh, the, the plastic, all you need is to say, right, well, you, you allocate this amount of fuel coming in that's come from the plastics industry, that, that, that is contribution to that plastic. As they do right now with, with, with uh, uh, organic, with, with, with uh, uh, biomaterial for when you're doing biofuels, you do a mass balance across the refinery. And, and several of the major players in Europe are proposing that. Now, the, uh, the policy makers, I don't think, are, are quite up to speed yet. So this is all brand new and they're trying to sort it out. So there is a, a lobby developing just to get that legislation right, because it's very key then to this support that if, if, if everybody believes this is the way to go, we need the financial support early to develop the technology. And that financial support will be dependent upon you getting recycling status. So nobody's trying to cheat anybody here. It's just a rational uh, a measurement system that we're trying to agree on. But clearly, as we do go back to food grade, I, I can't understand why there would any be any other negative even if some of the material that we, we sent into the refinery came out as, as a fuel, you're displacing fossil fuel coming in anyway. So uh, it, it's not, we're not burning the plastic. That's the key. Thank you, um, Adrian. Paula? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I think, I think chemical recycling challenges are our notion of recycling because for a long time, um, even though paralysis and other processes have been around for several decades, um, mechanical recycling is, has been, has created the definition of recycling. And um, it, it's interesting, you know, from our perspective, chemical recycling is part of the recycling world network um but but special attention needs to be paid um and uh policies and incentives in the market need to be developed in order to ensure that what we're creating is actually circular whether it be closed or open systems but circular supply chains and that um we're not permitting um, or we're not allowing for the majority of the output of chemical recycling, you know, to go or to, to not remain in our economy um, for multiple generations. Cause that's, that's the, the second wave um, or the second life to chem a ticket around uh, advanced recycling technologies that we're seeing is really um, an enthusiasm for how we can build circular economies. So ensuring that we are actually building circular economies that are safe um, it is really what we should be aiming and, and creating our supply chains and policies around. 
Thank you. I, I just want to pick up a quick point there. You, you, you talk about that secondary life. I, I'm wondering whether does chemical recycling give you, you know, infinite lives or is there a limit do we think to the number of times that those uh, monomers can go round and round the system? Because we, when we talk about mechanical recycling, particularly with plastics, we talk about maybe five to seven loops before that material just becomes too degraded and the you know the quality of the bottle looks looks jaded it looks it looks scuffed um so it, uh, does chemical recycling kind of you know reinvent the number of loops and and is that another you know very positive message here for for the opportunities around chemical recycling but if I, I, if I just say so one of the uh, of the material that's gone around five times in mechanical recycling then it can come into chemical recycling <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very good sound speech. Just been extending the line. <laughs> so we, I think, all the systems. This is this is really just the chemistry of it. Uh, we are at about eighty-five percent thermally efficient in the process, and and I think most people are. It's just a nature of that, uh, uh, the process of cracking the polymers. We haven't beaten the second law of thermodynamics yet. So. Uh, so you, with that, if, if you're losing 15%, uh, and although some of that can be recovered as heat, but basically uh, right now, uh, uh, we're saying 85% thermal efficient, you can get what? You can get five or six times before that plastic disappears. So uh, it, it, you're never going to get anything. Uh, and it's very interesting when we're doing a lot of LCA studies as to even when you're mechanical recycling, you've got to measure the electricity that goes in, the washing, the cleaning. And if you then compare it to paper, then people would say on a carbon footprint or a glass or aluminium, the major difference, uh, uh, and the benefit of doing chemical recycling. But yeah, we, 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 we can't go infinitely, unfortunately. Uh, as no, no one well, can. Well, thank you for the honesty. And Paula, any, anything to add to that? No, I, I think there's work and research being done around you know what is what is the outer limit um, around chemical recycling and how many times can we keep those molecules um, or monomers rather and polymers in circulation um, but but it it certainly it it is uh, it adds on to the long to mechanical recycling to Adrian's point you know anything that can no longer be mechanically recycled can then become a feedstock into chemical recycling um, and we know that it's at least um, at least five to ten uh, rounds um, through different processes. So lots of potential Excellent. there, but needs to be very positive. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm particularly interested when, when Adrian does crack the uh, second law of thermodynamics, we will be running a webinar on that. It will be chargeable, unfortunately, because that will be groundbreaking and probably, <laughs> you know, the hottest property in town. Um, I jest. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we're running out of time. I'm conscious of more questions coming in. This is fantastic. Uh, I want to pick up about um, the quality of the oils through the system. I've heard anecdotally from some of these providers that have tried this uh, chemical recycling that they're just the contamination of their feedstock is, is crippling them in that middle phase as they're, you know, going back to oils before they, they, they then produce a fuel or, or produce a, a monomer or something. Is, is that the tricky phase that you've, you've in, encompassed in, in your experience, Paula? Um, we actually, as Closely Partners hasn't looked at the quality of the oil. Uh, that's something that we're going to be doing in this next phase of the, of the okay. chemical recycling research. So uh, let's check in Q4 of, the, of next year and I'll have some answers right, we've all, I've already got a webinar lined up for you. Thank you. And Adrian, I bet you've had a look at this one. Go on, what's, what's, what's your take on? on oh yeah, no, you, uh, absolutely. Quality. But I think the interesting point here is that a pyrolysis oil, so an oil that's derived from this, uh, what people don't realize and I, is, is that oils come in many, many, many different forms from C1 to C60 and different rings and circles and, uh, and therefore the oil is slightly different than you would get as fossil oil. So the oil industry was just not used to handling these oils. They're out right. of spec, if you will, but it's only because they've never handled them. So typically you'd have an assay, as they say, for Abu Dhabi crude versus Brent crude or whatever. And these are slightly different. But I think now what's happened, especially in the last two or three years, is, is a massive move from all of the majors into this space, saying, of course, we can handle them. It's just a change in the mindset. 
and, and I think that actually that is what one of the big changes that's happened is the major oils have realized they need to get into this game, that they need to be involved and they have the expertise. So whereas before perhaps there were some people trying to purify these oils on a small scale without the, the, the full capability, I think the, the transition will be we will ship a, a pyrolysis oil to uh, uh, the major players who will turn it into whatever they okay. do with oil now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they have the capability to do that at scale. So I, I think that, that is why we have a distributed model. We'll collect from various locations that oil and it will go to a major uh, center right. for processing. Uh, and, and by moving the oil around rather than the plastic, you don't want to take 10,000 trucks a day into the refinery. Um, so, uh, but, but these guys have all the skills to do that and, and they're now motivated and are working on it. You can see by all the announcements from all of them, they're yeah. all looking at our pyrolysis plant. So, pyrolysis plant. so I think we've crossed that, that hurdle too. It's been a major change. I, I think that's really interesting as well because you're talking about that supply chain and actually, yeah, using the expertise of the major players who are used to that, that oil or whatever it might be. It's critical, is it? Your job, you know, that intermediary, and that's that, that's the whole role of any, you know, waste management company, if you like, is we're an intermediary between stuff in the wrong format in the wrong place and getting it to the right format. Now, whether that's a, a dry recyclate or an aluminium can or it's a, a mixed grade paper, or in this case, it's it's, it's an oil, I, absolutely, and that has to be the evolution of our sector. Question. Yeah running out of time for both of you you've both mentioned mass balance life cycle analysis uh we've we've heard about carbon footprint now again anecdotal evidence suggests that some of the recycling um some of the chemical processing uh, systems that have been out there and have been tested don't always stack up as well as we might like because there is energy required to do the the cracking or whatever your 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 claim of an 85 percent thermal efficiency is is incredible and i i, I don't disagree with you i'm just it's it's unbelievable compared to many processing technologies that are out there um are, are we confident that the, the the analysis is sound and that the evidence base is increasingly in support of the uh, the carbon footprint and life cycle benefits of chemical recycling Adrian? I, well, I, I could only oh sorry paula you're up first go <laughs> sure yeah um i mean there's certain processes like paralysis that have been well studied and documented from um from a literature standpoint uh but to a point that you made earlier the diversity of the technologies that fall under advanced recycling and chemical recycling there are some very very new processes that need to be evaluated um and so that's part of um, I keep alluding to this study that we're doing in 2020, but essentially we're running a number of different analyses all in an effort to put an investor and partnership roadmap together at the end um, or in the fall of 2020. Um, and the environmental impact analysis of different technologies and human health impacts of those are a part of that body of work. Um, uh, it's also a gradient. So, you know, mechanical recycling compared to purification, compared to decomposition, compared to conversion technologies, you can think of that as a scale of energy usage as well. And so um, th there's a gradient there, but then ultimately what we have to be comparing that to is the virgin production of, pla the, L how the LCA, how that compares to the LCA of the virgin production of plastic and even landfilling, uh, because chemical recycling is, you know, is the solution to landfilling um, in many cases. Yeah, and, and so I just back up, I think you, you just said it, Paula, that the, the, the pyrolysis side is, is proven tested. I, I mean, the number I quote is straight out of a chemistry book. It's obviously going to be there. Where else can the energy go if you do? Uh, whereas some of the other processes are a lot more complicated. So obviously, not yet fully tested or proven, but I think from the pyrolysis side, we know clearly that's what it is. Thank you. So, winter last 10 minutes, I wanna to start to bring this to a, to a close and, and, and get some key thoughts. So I've got one question for the pair of you um, around developing transition economies. So many of our, many of our delegates will, will be sitting in, in India, Pakistan, Southeast Asia, they may be sitting in, 
in geographies where there's huge production of plastic packaging, which might get exported to the US or to, or to Europe. Where, where, most of the work being done in this space appears to be North America and, and Europe at the moment. What are the opportunities and how quickly do we think we can get those opportunities into some of those transition economies who are just on the cusp of getting their collection infrastructure right? You know, that's taken a long time. I certainly, my experience has seen how difficult it can be to get, you know, a decent curbside collection, even of just general rubbish. So is this part of their solution or have they still got a very long way to go before we start seeing chemical recycling playing a, a core role in a transition economy like parts of Southeast Asia or, or, or Central Africa even. What, what do you reckon, Adrian? I know you're traveling the world at the moment. Uh, I think clearly the, the first step is stimulated right now by EPR uh, monies uh, that the technology will be proven uh, in the areas that are supporting it, probably in Europe before the US because there's more stimulus in Europe. Um, as soon as that technology is, is proven uh, and therefore de-risked, I think you can go immediately uh, across the world because you'll be able to show the economic straight away. So I have spent many years in Africa. There's plastic there available. There's actually, if you can motivate the collection systems with, with token amounts of, of, of feed money, that plastic will never end up in the ditches where it is now. It'll be picked up and taken over. And you can see that if you're in Indonesia or uh, elsewhere. So uh, I, I think very rapidly, you will be able to hit these transition economies. I think it, it will be just a commercial process that they themselves will want to pick up. Um, and that's my feeling. I, I, I don't think we, it even needs to be a sophisticated, a development collection system as you might have in Europe that Suez might run for. I think if you stimulate uh, uh, the, the collection of plastic through a token amount of, of, of gate fee for that material or, or, or a payment for that uh, uh, material, and, and very soon we, we, we envisage being able to pay for the uh, plastic coming in, that will it'll also it, it, it'll be viable to also stimulate the local economy because instead of all of that waste now you can have lots of people employed collecting this and i think for pet that's already been demonstrated in some areas i know in south africa and other areas where you monetize that people you know collect the bottles and bring them to the plant it's big business yeah i i agree that chemical recycling, there, there are more incentives and actions being done in Europe and we're likely to see that come online in Europe before the US, but there's an entirely, you know, to a, a, the point that I was making earlier around recycling being local, I, the, what, what the path of probable and, and possible will be in these transition economies uh, it's going to look very different than Europe and the U.S. Right now, Europe and the U.S. are in a situation where they have an established recycling and collection system, and they're, we're kind of scratching our heads trying to figure out, all right, how do we integrate these technologies in the systems that we already have? Um, perhaps in these transition economies, chemical recycling will allow for them to leapfrog from an infrastructure standpoint, um, but that needs to be entirely sorted out by the local, you know, the local players um, and what that will look like, I'm really interested in seeing. I think also, you know, island economies, like the, um, going plastics to fuel for island economies, like that is an, an entire, you know, webinar in and of itself, but an interesting application and, and thought um, around like how, um, how, the application of, of these different technologies can take different shape and form um, depending on the geography and local needs. Um, yeah, the local needs. So, so I, I think you right. just said, oh. so I, I, I was just gonna say, chemical recycling once it gets going is very disruptive. So in fact, to your point, it may be that some of the systems we have now in Europe and the US are actually negative. Uh, and we'd be much better off just like, you know, going wireless mobile rather than laying copper. 
right. and, and it may be it may be easier to transition in in developing countries than it actually is in the developed world. Mm -hmm. Right, that's fantastic. Now I've got a sudden plethora of other questions come in, and I'm going to go for quick fire round, one of you yeah. at a time. So let's go with Paul. Uh, let's go with uh, you, Adrian, first. Uh, can you do composite materials through yes, the te absolutely. these technologies? Yeah, okay, absolutely. thank you. That's one. Go on, yeah, that's absolutely that's key. That's key. That's key okay. to, to, to put an enable it. Where mechanical recycling can't do composites, we can. Um, we've already had quite a bit of conversation about carbon footprints and emissions, but are both of you convinced that chemical recycling has a key role to play in the fight against climate change? Absolutely, yes. Much more than people think, because it will enable the use of plastic. And a lot of people think when you say that, the guy's crazy, but it will enable the use of plastic. Yeah, I think, I think there's a use case for it, um, but continued research needs to be done um, around what, what, that, what the gains are um, and stakeholders have to be kind of educated around what the potential and, and realities um, of those gains are. Okay, another, thank you. Another quick one. Um, is there a role for converters to redesign for chemical recycling so that there's more standardization around certain polymers so that both mechanical and chemical recycling can become much more efficient based on that mixed collection bin? Absolutely. There you Absolutely, go. Adrian? Yes. Certainly on the laminates, <laughs> there are certain combinations we, 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 even we have difficulty with. So, and it's very easy for them to change. So they need educating as to making a, a, a composite that is totally non-recyclable. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of these are very easy to do, but we can still have composites. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a third vote from me. Yes, good. Uh, quick one, problem with um, flame retardants and toxic chemicals that are in some plastics. How does chemical recycling deal with those or not deal with those? Yeah, well, well, from our side with pyrolysis, and I can only speak from our side. So within that process, that is all part of the technology that's been developed is to take out those those uh, uh, halogens that are in the, the, the fire retardants, heavy metals for colouring and inks. It is all part of the technology that's been developed in chemical recycling to clean up that material such that it can be fed into the refinery. So between the refinery, the petrochemical sector and, and our sector, we're working very diligently on solving all those solutions. So yes, we can take all the contaminants in. Fantastic. So I've, I'm going to give you literally 30 seconds for one key message, Adrian. What would you like to share with the panelists before I wrap this up? Chemical recycling is here. Uh, be aware of it. It's going to happen a lot faster than people think. And you, Paula? Yeah, I think we're at an extremely uh, interesting and important time in human history around our concern and action to deal with the plastic waste crisis that we're in. Um, chemical recycling is, is part of a solution a set uh, that is going to address our plastic waste crisis. Um, it's exciting to see the amount of investment and partnership in the sector, um, but without collaboration between brands, technologies, investors, governments, converters, everyone in the value chain, we are not going to move the needle on developing the systems to support these solutions because these solutions don't exist in isolation but need to be part of a general system. Um, without collaboration, we, we aren't going to meet a lot of the goals that we've set out around um, sustainability and circularity. Um, and more research needs to be done uh, on you know, the diverse set of technologies that fall under the chemical recycling umbrella to understand, uh, to really understand which solutions make the most sense given different contexts and understand what the impacts from a community, human health and environmental perspective are. Um, and Close with Partners is excited to be at the forefront of that um, and, and working with a very di diverse group of stakeholders um, to essentially 
build a roadmap for how we can create a circular future. Fantastic. Thank you. Remind me not to ask you for a short answer, though, Paula, because we could be here for <laughs> <laughs> um, That's been fantastic. I'd like to thank Paula. I'd like to thank Adrian. They've been very open. They've been very honest. Uh, hopefully, they've given uh, those of you that have dialed in some insights. I think the key thing for me is there's so many questions that just kept coming in and in. We could have been here for another hour. Uh, Sweater, maybe we're going to have to run another session on this. But what we will do is we'll capture those questions. I think a lot of them have had partial answers um, during our discussion, so that's been good. But if we haven't, we'll make sure the, the, the relevant panelists can, can, can get back in touch with you and let you know, you know where you can get that, that reference report or what the life cycle impact of virgin versus recycled content may or may not look like. So don't worry, everybody. There's plenty of opportunity for us to um, continue this dialogue because I think from my perspective, you know, and from Suez's perspective, you know, chemical recycling is here. Chemical recycling has huge opportunity in scale. Uh, the potential is obvious. We just need to work out where it fits. And a, a bit like Paula said, how it fits with other things that are already in the system and where, as Adrian said, where it disrupts the current system to make sure we get the right system going forward that does deliver all the carbon benefits and all of those social benefits that, that we want. It's been an absolute pleasure to host this on behalf of Be Waste Wise. I've been Dr. Adam Reid and I am the External Affairs Director of Suez here in the UK and I wish you all a Merry Christmas and I'm going to hand back to Sweater to wrap up at Be Waste Wise. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Paula. And thank you, Adrian. So I know that we haven't answered quite a few of your questions. So I'm going to try and get in touch with the panelists and try and get responses for the questions. And uh, if you have anything else that you want to ask, please write to us at connect at wastewise.be and we will make sure that uh, we connect you with the panelists or we try and get the response from the panelists and uh, you will have your answers for sure. And uh, yes, thanks a lot for participating. And uh, that's, that's it. Happy holidays. And we will see you in uh, January. Uh, and uh, for the attendees, we're going to be sending out a survey to you uh, 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 later today. So please make sure you respond to our survey. That will be very helpful to us at Be Waste Wise. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to the panelists. Bye-bye. Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.